Hey, welcome back. This is episode number 60 for the Dear Baseball Gods podcast. And uh, yeah, it's a lot of episodes. I have one exciting announcement uh, after this like 11 day layoff. Um, this is being shot on a new camera. It's the first time that's actually being shot on a camera, not on a webcam, uh, which is exciting to me. And uh, same mic, which I've just decided to keep in frame. So if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're kind of seeing the microphone for the first time, usually I hide it, which is not hard. I can just, I could easily put this off screen, but I think I'm going to look probably trendier if I have it on screen. It makes me look important, even though I'm doing this in my apartment. Uh, but just like anything, God, it's even been just being a year. I wish I knew what I know now a year ago, because in the last year, and it is about a year since I really started uh, embarking on some of the endeavors that are occupying most of my time right now, which are creating online courses, which I have four more that I'm going to be finishing soon. Um, my book, which I completed the third draft recently and I'm excited about. So that's moving on to an external editor who's well, still a friend of mine, but uh, it's not a family member. I am fortunate to have a family of amazing writers, uh, good editors, people who are honest with me, even though, even though they, they love me. But uh, this is going to an external editor and I'm hopeful, I'm confident I'll be able to finish that by March 1st. And, uh, but this last year, I've done so much stuff on the web. Uh, I've done, I've been engrossed in YouTube stuff recently and I've, I really enjoy it and I find a lot of value in it. And I'm just trying to embrace uh, a changing world more than anything. And so with that has come, you know, just watching other YouTubers, watching other podcasters, watching all other just people doing things better than I do it, who are farther along in the process, you realize just how important audio quality is. And we have good microphones like Lucas and I, my partner who we do the Twinsies podcast, which is uh, our podcast together because we have the same birthday. That's why we're Twinsies. I'm three years older, but we both have December 15th as our birthday. And uh, so we, we got good microphones. This is like a pretty decent mic that you can see on, on camera here. It's like a $70 microphone and we own a couple of them. We uh, got these little boom arms. We got a, a nice uh, audio recorder, which we actually don't use that much anymore because we started feeding it directly into my laptop. Uh, better webcams because apparently you buy a $1,300 Apple computer and it still comes with a junky 720p webcam, which I feel like Steve Jobs would be kicking in his grave if he knew that, although he's he was the guy who still was at the helm when they were still doing that. They have not upgraded to 1080. I don't know why. But anyway, even with that, uh, and I've been filming a lot of video on my iPhone. I've got a couple little mics that plug into my iPhone. So if you, uh, follow me on Snapchat or Instagram and you see a video, chances are the audio quality sounds better than a normal person because I have a little mic that I plugged into it and, uh, it just makes it sound better. So I'm, I'm very sensitive to trying to give people the best, um, experience I can. And, uh, because if I'm going to do something, I continue to try to do it well. So in the past, I think, four months, I've bought an iPad Pro. Uh, I've got a bunch of new audio equipment. I've got this new Panasonic Lumix uh, camera, which is significantly better video quality than my iPhone, which even in like 4K, like the 1080 that I'm filming this on is way better than the 4K of my phone. I don't understand why. I really like understanding, like, especially so I could comparison shop, like why does this camera take better photos or videos? Uh, it's still not clear to me. I don't know. So if you're a tech person, you want to film me and shoot me an email. I thought it was like megabits per second. I thought it was the, which is the data rate, all these different factors, but there's still, I don't know. Got a new lavalier wireless mic system. So any videos that I'm demonstrating baseball stuff, instead of relying on a really strong like boom mic attached to my, or shotgun mic attached to the camera or one of the little mics attached to my phone, uh, it will now be a wireless lavalier set. So that goes right into the camera directly. And I filmed, about 10 videos the other day with that and it sounds fantastic and I'm really happy with it. I think it was definitely completely worth it. And of course, as I compare that to some of my videos that I recorded, you know, even a couple months ago, it makes me really sad that they sound terrible by comparison and look terrible by comparison. So, uh, the, there's a nagging part of me now that wants to refilm literally everything that I've done to this point to bring it up to like the new standard, but I also would rather shoot myself than do that. So, that's probably not going to happen. I think I'll probably update a lot of those videos uh, over time. 
just to make them look a little better. I also had hair this time a year ago, and I chose not to wear a hat in my videos, which I regret because my hair uh, looked worse than I thought it looked. So anyway, a lot of fascinating things, but this is episode 60, which is in no way a milestone because who cares about the number 60, but uh, a lot of changes in this episode, and it's the first time I'm, like I said, recording this mic directly into my camera. So it's going to be interesting. We'll see how this uh, this all plays out. But So today's podcast topic is how do you tu- how do you trust that a coach knows what he's doing. And I got a good email from a person recently and I've uh, lamented on internet trolls and internet, just, I don't know, people in general, people tend to, to write the rudest possible. Uh, they write in the rudest possible manner in which they could ask a question. So they could be like, Hey, you know, I'm not really sure I agree with you on this, but can you explain why that's a really polite way of asking like, you know, Hey, like why, why do I not, trust that what you're saying is true. Uh, but other people just like want to like, just say it in such a rude, rude way. And it's like, dude, I'm putting out free information for your benefit. Uh, you know, if you're a coach, you don't have to like jump to being a jerk and proving that I'm an idiot. Uh, there's also a lot of context, but anyway, I was saying, I got a really long email from a softball coach who, uh, just was questioning one of the recent softball videos that I filmed about a mechanical thing. That's very widely done pointing the ball to center field. I was taught this as a kid throwing a baseball. If you watch major league baseball players, which they're the guys, all the research on pitchers is done or all the research is done on pitchers. If you watch these guys, zero people, uh, turn the ball to center field, like not exactly zero, but like one out of like pretty much literally zero. So, uh, this whole cue of like teaching kids to throw, whether it's a baseball or a softball, you don't turn the ball to center field. It makes a little logical sense because when you're landing, the ball should be facing third base for your righty because then as your hips rotate, it just goes straight behind. It just lays back and now your hands behind the ball and then it's on the top of the center of the ball as you, as you go forward. It makes sense that way. Uh, however, uh, people still teach that and it's just mis- misinformation. I'm not like picking on anybody, but uh, it's just not the right way to do it. So it's not a good thing to teach. I've been kind of trying to debunk some myths on the softball side and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, so anyway, he wrote me a really long email and I, what I appreciated about it was that he had a lot of concerns because some of the things I had explained conflicted with what he had heard and heard from all like tr- sources that he trusted. So he had some dissonance and, uh, he didn't accuse me of anything. He wasn't rude. He was just like, look, I, I have a lot of, here's a, why I believe the things I believe. Here's all of the stuff I've heard. It conflicts with yours. You actually seem pretty knowledgeable. So can you help me out and explain why you're contradicting this other guy and yada, yada, yada. And it was, like I said, I appreciate the email. I sent him a long response back. Uh, I hope it was satisfactory, but it's a really good topic. So when you've done some research and this is a high school softball coach, when you've done some research, whether you're a parent or player or coach and, uh, you stuff that you've like put time into trying to learn the game and learn what's the right way to teach your son or to, to do it yourself or to teach your team. Uh, and then you find someone who's teaching something counter to that. You want to know like, okay, I have two trusted sources, which one's right. And how do I know, how do I know that this guy's, uh, how do I know I should trust his opinion, especially when there's a lot of stuff in pitching and throwing and all this other stuff. That's not necessarily a research back. There's a lot of research out there, but not everything is researched and there's not every, and it's just like, that's how exercise is research takes a long time to do properly and junky research is just that it's junky research when people say, Oh, I did a little research study in my, in my facility and we got 30 athletes and you just don't know if those conclusions are valid. If the methodology was good, you know, I studied psychology and philosophy in college and we did a lot of research, uh, study design work. And that was one of the very few things that I retained for my major. But you know, you, you just learn like there's a very strong burden of proof for good research. There's tons of bad research out there. And just because research is published doesn't mean it's good research. There's tons of research that's published. That's absolute trash. I'm not really sure why that is because they usually go through a lot of peer review. Uh, but that is the lay of the land. So just because it's published doesn't mean it's valid and well done either. So it's, it's hard to navigate some of that stuff, but say you have, you know, you're talking to a minor league pitching, a minor league pitching guy. He's your pitching coach. He played five years in the minor leagues and he's teaching you one way. And then you have another guy on YouTube like myself played five years in the minor leagues or whatever. And uh, he's saying something different, both reputable sources, 
neither of you or neither of you have maybe a chip on your shoulder. You're just trying to teach it the way that you think that it should be taught. So how do you figure out if someone's reputable and uh, what factors should you consider? So I'm going to stop talking and uh, let's get into it. So number one, I think it's really valuable to have playing experience. There's more pitching coaches now and instructors, whether it's pitching or hitting, this isn't really specific to pitching, but there's more out there than ever that don't have a strong playing background. I think that's in part for that's in part because social media and the internet in general, you can learn so much stuff and sort of masquerade almost like as a fraud if you wanted to, where you could just like I could just read literally everything I wanted to read about welding. And I actually welded in high school. I actually really enjoy it. It's a good hobby. I'll probably pick up back when I'm an old person or something. But I could read literally everything there is. I could watch a million YouTubes on uh, on welding. And I could masquerade in forums, uh, all this other stuff. And if I had a good web presence, I could make a website. I could make an online course. I could teach you how to weld despite probably having little real world welding experience. Uh, that's maybe not the best example because you actually do have to weld stuff. <laughs> but, um, you know, like with pitching or strength training or any of this other stuff, you can go on online. And I remember I, there are a lot of people out there that I know that did this, that just like read everything that Eric Cressy ever wrote on strength training, strength training specifically for baseball. And then you just regurgitate it because it's great information. And if you regurgitate it enough, people think it's coming from you and, uh, and you've internalized the knowledge and you use it in your own practice maybe. But, um, th like, does that make you, I don't know, like he acquired all that knowledge that he shared through actually training people for a long time and actually training those baseball players. And then I could take all of that knowledge. That's all very, very valid and tried and true and just tell all the people to do it. But there's still, you're missing a large part of the little stuff that ends up mattering a lot. So a lot of this stuff doesn't matter that much. You know, you could read everything you ever wanted, write a good strength training program, potentially from stuff you've compiled on the internet without having ever trained a person. And you could give that to someone, they'd probably do it and get better. And so that's like, you know, it's, it's hard to say if that's a good or bad thing, because I know from being a strength coach for a long time and actually working with a lot of athletes and specifically baseball and softball players and specifically kids who are new to lifting weights. I know there's lots of stuff that I thought was good early in my career that, uh, just like didn't really work in practice. I write a workout that I thought was awesome. And then like kids wrists are hurting from a certain exercise at a certain volume or kids are throwing up because they're doing these two exercises in a row. And like when you pair those together without enough rest, they just kind of get pukey. There's lots of stuff like that. And the same goes with, with sports instruction, with pitching instruction, hitting instruction. When you don't have a, a pretty significant playing experience, you just lose all like the, the little details, like the craftsmanship. Like you might be able to build a chair, but you wouldn't be able to build like, <laughs> again, probably not the best analogy, like, a chair that a, a craftsman who's been building chairs for 20 years could build, right? Just the attention to detail, the little things, the stuff that an ordinary person wouldn't really know. All those little details are important. And sometimes they just don't, I mean, sometimes you just don't have time to go over that stuff in a, in a short lesson. Sometimes it doesn't matter that much. It also depends on the age of the athlete, but playing experience really does matter because playing experience gives you the critical knowledge of what's not important more than anything else. Cause it's really easy to, to watch baseball and to watch, you know, young athletes and say, he should be doing it this way. He should be doing it this way. He should, why isn't he doing that? He should train this way. When in real life, that stuff doesn't really stick super well. That's why I don't do a ton of like really fatty F A D D Y fatty, uh, like drills. And I don't do tons of gimmicky things. I'm not using, I'm not putting harnesses on people. And uh, even though I like, I know there's a couple of different companies that make like velocity harnesses that have some things that help you get a feel for your hips. And I'm not saying they're bad. I just don't, haven't personally used them much. Uh, I try to, I try to use those things sort of just like a rocket boosters where you just use it for a little bit, you get feel. And that's, I think a lot of the way that those things are used actually. But, um, you know, you, I just know that the biggest thing because of all, all my playing experience was that just throwing a ball and having a really high focus and level of determination to make every throw better than the next and to have a sort of level of perfection on every single throw that to me was, is the biggest thing and finding drills that help improve your mechanics, but then doing them over and over and over and over and over. Whereas there's lots of kids and parents that run from drill to drill and instructor and instructor trying to find the next new big thing that's going to like fix them or cure them or be the magic pill. And it just isn't really like that. And, uh, 
And when you've played, you realize that it's not really like that. Like the strongest people in the world, all these Olympians, you know, major leaguers, NBA players, like they just shoot baskets. Like they just swing. They just throw. You know, they, they just lift weights over and over. They practice their technique. But a lot of it is the, just the really like the basics and getting super good at the basics. And, uh, and then just a lot of, of the, the mental side of baseball only comes when you have playing experience. I was recently watching the uh, Dodgers Brewers game. And uh, in like the seventh inning, this really annoying guy uh, at, a, at a table with like his girlfriend and uh, another couple people. Uh, he got extra annoying because he started talking really loudly about baseball. And he's being really opinionated and he didn't know anything. And he, and he was acting. He was very clearly trying to show off his baseball knowledge, you know, talking like he was really important. And uh, he knew just enough to be like knowledgeable enough if he didn't know the game. But since I didn't like know the game, I hated him. I hated him more than, oh, he just ruined my game because he was just like complaining about stuff that just doesn't matter he was complaining about pitch calls and he didn't know anything about um about hitters taking pitches and uh the last batter of the game was struck out on a high fastball out of the zone 99 miles per hour he's like that idiot he if he just stood there and not taking the bat off his shoulder if he hadn't swung the bat once he'd be on first base right now it's like well yeah dude the guy's throwing 99 miles per hour and uh there's a the tying runs like on first base and there's two outs. You think he's just going to stand up there and put the bat on the shoulder. You don't think he's, tr you think he's trying to strike out like just like stuff like that. Anyway, I'm getting on a tangent, but playing experience is really important. It's not the only thing. There's a lot of great coaches that didn't have super high baseball resumes. I know tons of them. So you have to, it's, but it's one factor. If you had two coaches who are equal, obviously you take the one with higher playing experience. And I know one of the regrets about my career, it's not a regret, but I just learned so much new stuff every single year that I played, especially as I moved up in levels and played with better players and against better players, I learned so many new things every year that it made me sad when I was done because I wouldn't learn more stuff. Like there's so much stuff that goes on at the big league level that there are a couple of things I commented on like little Instagram posts that I kind of like took a major league baseball clip and wrote a little commentary about the play. There were a couple of times where um, some guys who are either like a double AA, A, triple A coach or a guy who played in the big leagues. I know a couple of those guys around Instagram and they commented and like shared an insight in that specific play that like, I didn't know. And they're like, no, that's not exactly what's going on. It's like mostly what's going on, but this actually probably happened too. And I'm like, that's amazing. That's really cool. And you just like, don't learn that stuff unless you played at just certain levels. And again, I wish I had more of that because I, I think that stuff, that nuance about baseball is really cool. Uh, so playing experience is obviously important, uh, but again, it's not the only factor either. Coaching experience, I'd say, is probably more important than playing experience, given a certain requisite of uh, of playing experience, because just because you play doesn't mean you're going to be able to re relate or relay the things that you've learned in a sensible manner, especially to kids. Now, uh, our clientele at Warbird Academy is more young kids than not. And I don't regret that. I know in, in the uh, the training world, in the sports instruction world, it's like a every pro athlete, every Division One athlete is like a trophy on your mantle mantelpiece, and almost you, you measure your worth by how many pro athletes come out of your program. But really, if you live in a big enough area, like a big metro area, and you're a successful business, been around, you'll get your share of high level athletes that become D one and pros. And if you live in a smaller town, like you just may not get as many. And uh, and to be perfectly honest, it's it's very challenging to speak and explain high level concepts that are important to a nine year old or 10 year old or 11 year old who isn't going to get it. If you use all this weird biomechanical language, if you, unless you really simplify and it made me a better coach over time because I wanted to see if I could explain the stuff that I would teach a 17 year old to a 10 year old. And obviously like the concepts are different. I don't want to make it overly complex for a kid, but can you teach them like really important stuff that I didn't learn until I was 18, 19, 20, 21? Can I teach that to a 12 year old in a way that he understands it and like can really internalize it? And I'm personally proud that I can do that. And I've gotten better at that each year. And that's a, a source of pride to me where I don't feel like I've, I'm a lesser instructor because I don't have a million pro athletes. Like, A, I've only been in this town eight years. And uh, a lot of our kids are just now growing up. Like we're going to have a couple pro guys that were like homegrown from our program, but it obviously takes a long time. Like some of my first clients were like 12 years old and they're now 19, 20. So 
it's a, uh, it's one of those things, but it just depends on what you want to accomplish as an instructor. And as a parent coach, when you're looking for an instructor, coaching experience really matters because the more young kids they've dealt with, the more they, they, they get, they see the blank stare when they make, they just don't explain it well. And I've seen countless blank stares and I've learned to be shorter and more to the point and just like give there's a balance between activity and talking and teaching and letting them do it and figure it out in a lesson that it's kind of complex. And over time, me and my partner both have a system for it, uh, but it's still like it's been honed over time and every year we get better at it. Every year I learn, I start to change the way I do things. And uh, so the coaching experience and private instruction experience are really important. So if you had a guy who was fresh out of the minor leagues and hadn't really given many pitching lessons, or you had a guy who had been giving maybe hundreds or thousands of lessons in the last couple of years, that's probably the guy that you want to go with because he's honed his craft. It's like anything, it's practice, and uh, practice makes perfect, right? So it's, it's not a situation where you want to just go on playing experience because I know I've met lots of guys who can't explain how good they were and, or why they were as good as they are. And, uh, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to internalize. Sometimes athletes, they just, from a young age, they just grab the ball and they go and they're just really good. And, uh, everyone has to work hard to get to a high level, but some guys work harder than others. And a lot of times the mediocre players, and you'll hear the sentiment over and over and over the guys who really have to strive extra hard just to stay on the field compared to their more talented peers. And I'm an example of that. Those guys often are just better at internalizing new ways of practicing seeking out new ways of practicing and getting better. And then at the same time, teaching those to others because they had to strive extra hard to, to find ways to do things for, you know what I mean? So, um, you got to think about their skills as an athlete and how much time they put in doing drills and learning new drills and seeking out info and new coaches and being coachable to get where they got. And, uh, so the, the ultimate level of play is probably less, um, I would say it's almost definitely less important than how much they worked as a player to get better because, Again, coaching experience really matters, and there's lots of stuff. I learned a lot of stuff as a head coach last year for the first time of what matters and what doesn't and how you should explain things, how you shouldn't, how you should go about just the overall mindset uh, as a coach and what players' mindsets are. So I think coaching experience is really important, so you want to try to look for more experienced instructors, guys who have been in baseball for a long time or in your sport, whatever it is, uh, because I think that's that's more valuable than playing experience. Because again, playing experience doesn't mean you're a good coach, but coaching experience doesn't mean you're a good coach. But at least you've been coaching a lot of players, and chances are, if you're if you're doing it, especially if you're a full time living, or if you're doing it on the side, uh, you know, it's still something that you're in it because you're passionate about it, and hopefully that pays dividends. Um, number three, three, I would say just reference people, and that seems obvious, but I think a lot of times people don't. I think a lot of people, times people will just go to a facility and they'll, uh, you know, they'll just, all right, I'll take that instructor or whatever. But I think obviously there's like a personality fit. And a lot of times you can't tell that until you've, uh, you've done some work with that person for a while. And, uh, you know, that's, there's a breaking in process there, but you know, you got to understand that as an, as, especially as a private instructor who makes their full-time living, uh, customer service is part of the job. And while myself and my partner in our business does not have a hundred percent satisfaction rate, and I hate that term, but we have like a very high percentage of happy clients that tell other people to come to us that would give a reference. And when we don't, we do what we can to make them happy because we know one negative review, uh, one person we didn't treat as well as we should have is going to hurt us in the long run and not just from a business standpoint, but just because we care about the kids that we work with and that's why we do it. So, uh, if you start to smell out that, like this person's maybe just doing it as a side job and needs just the paycheck and doesn't know what else to do with their life. And so they're just kind of coaching baseball or they're kind of just doing lessons until they figure it out. Uh, you know, you, people do that because baseball is a very transient kind of, uh, industry like you're in it and then you're out of it all of a sudden and you don't know what to do and like i've been facing that myself but at the same time you want to figure out um is this person just cashing a paycheck or are they 
they really care about my kid. And if they really care about my kid, then they'll pass on a lot of the positive lessons that they've learned from their career and also try to find solutions when they don't. Because there's been a lot of times when I've worked with players and there still are when I do everything that I thought I should do and that I know how to do and I'm not getting good results. And then I go back to the drawing board and I start to try to find and do research, whether it's on the internet or whatever, trying to find out like, what else can I do to try to break through? How else can I explain this? What's like, what do I do? Like, it's not okay to have a kid continually trust them or trust you with their career and just not deliver on it. That's hard. And, uh, and that's usually what drives good instructors to get better and to continue to evolve over time is those kids who are hard, who don't respond as well as other kids. So that's a big driver. So when you talk to a couple of parents or a couple of players, or a couple of coaches who've worked with that person, uh, you know, and definitely get a bunch of references, not just one or two, you know, you'll start to, uh, you'll start to formulate who it seems like that person is. And at the end of the day, if, if they all say that that person clearly cared about my kid and enjoyed working with them, that's, that's a, a big, big positive, obviously. Um, I think social media presence is important nowadays. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean you're good or bad as an instructor or as a coach, but I think it shows a commitment to being in coaching longer term. And this is certainly a generational thing. So I, I wouldn't put a 50 year old coach in the same boat as a younger coach, but for a younger up and coming guy, I mean, like social media is important and it doesn't, there's no set follower count, but I know that when I look people up, when I like see someone liked one of my videos or commented or. I've heard of a coach and I look them up and they have no followers or very few followers. I, I immediately think this person is a, no, is a nobody or is brand new or I don't know. It's a, it's an unfortunate side effect and that's a quick judgment. I don't necessarily believe they're nobody, but they're kind of a nobody in the industry. And when you see a coach who's got like a lot of followers, tens of thousands or more, you, you at least know that a lot of people are tuned in and paying attention. doesn't mean they're good at their job. There's definitely a lot of incompetent ones out there. I can, I could rattle off a bunch for sure. Uh, who have a big following, who are great at marketing themselves, but are kind of stupid or kind of miss the point and uh, don't really get it. And this kind of goes back to playing experience. There's a lot of coaches that can have a great social media presence, had a moderate playing experience, and clearly just don't get the higher level stuff that they think they do. I'm not a big fan of those people. Uh, it's not to say they're bad people or anything, but I'm like, there's holes and people that have been there can see those holes. Uh, but anyway, like having a social media presence is... I mean, it is a indicator that people are paying attention to this person, that people are working with them. It's just social proof, right? It's just social proof. So something to pay attention to. I don't think that's a make or break thing, but it's obviously a factor. Um, and then number five, I would say here is, uh, are they a lifer or are they part-time? Because there's a definite difference. And this kind of goes back to customer service and how you treat people. Uh, when you have to pay your rent and put food on the table, and pay your mortgage and all this other stuff because teaching kids baseball is your full-time job. You approach it completely differently than if you don't need the money uh, or if you do need the money, but only in a part-time sense to give a full-time job. There's a very big difference. And uh, Lucas, my partner and I have been all in for a long time. And we know that we, if we give people crappy experiences, then that's not going to bode well. We're going to become homeless people, I guess. But so that's a big factor. And you, obviously want a coach who's going to be there in the long term for your kid. And obviously people always, you know, you just be, if your kid's 12, doesn't mean their coach is going to be there for you till they graduate. That's a long period of time. People change, they have families, they have kids, all that stuff, you know, life happens. But at the same time there's uh, and this happened to one of our, uh, a softball girls from the past, you know, she hit with, uh, with, with Lucas for a couple years and she was kind of a coach jumper a little bit found a, a, a female softball instructor. And I get that softball players often will much more heavily identify with a female hitting coach compared to a male. Completely get it. Totally fine. Um, but she jumped to another hitting instructor and they've been working together, Lucas and her, for a long time. And I kind of warned them against it because they were going to be in our facility for the next bunch of years. Like we knew they were really bought in and all that stuff. And, uh, like, you know, like you guys have been making progress. Like he's going to be here for the long haul. You know, this person, other person, good or not, it doesn't sound like they're going to be in town for that much longer. It doesn't sound like you're going to be here for the long haul. And sure enough, like six months later, full-time job. See ya. So it's like, all right, you, you spent all this time with this person getting all these lessons. And then they were just like, 
biding their time waiting for a full-time job and then see you later. And that's hard to keep jumping from instructor to instructor. You don't really want to do that if you can, because the better you know somebody, and I've, I've worked with some kids now for, since uh, I have a kid who, who's in college now, he's going to be turning 20. If he's not 20 already, I've worked with him since he was 12 years old. I know that kid personality wise his mechanics. I've seen his progression from years to years. Like I've seen changes in him. I know him as well as he knows himself probably as a pitcher. And, uh, like that's important because I can immediately see him having not seen him pitch for six months. Cause he's off in college now. And I know like, he's not right. Like he needs to do this and this and he, he'll be right back on track. It's just like a mechanic who's worked on cars long enough. They can immediately see a problem and fix it really quick. And it's just, you know, having that rapport too long term. And then just, you know, like the connection where they could shoot me a text and we could talk about an outing they had or this and that. And it's, uh, that's tough when you're always jumping instructors, you know, you want to try to develop a, a deeper bond. So you want to look for someone who's more bought in, who's probably been doing this for a while and try to sniff out their situation. You know, is it just been, they just started doing this and they're actively seeking a full-time job and that's a lot of people and that's okay. And that doesn't mean they don't care, but it does mean that they you know, the, the rapport that you build and the progress that you might, might, or you make might suddenly just get snipped. And again, that's just not really ideal. So, you know, a coach can, can make or break an athlete's, uh, long-term development. And, uh, you know, you just want to try to have someone who's in it for the long haul with you as well, if you can. And again, big metro areas, a lot of turnover, um, especially with, you know, minor league guys coming out of baseball and, and, female softball instructors coming right out of division one, division two, II, division three, junior college softball and, and instructing. And they're excited about it, but there's still the next phase of their life too. So it's not a bad thing, but you know, I think if you could pick, you probably want to pick a life or someone who's making their living from teaching the sport. So a uh, couple red flags as we wrap up, as you sit there, if you listen to the lesson, if you, it's, you know, whatever it is, uh, you can be on both sides of the railroad tracks. So there's a lot of stuff on the internet now that I have a major problem with that people, uh, and it, it, it still seems back going back to like young coaches or people who didn't play as much. They want to make it seem as confusing as possible. As far as I can tell, like I can, I read people's tweets sometimes. And I'm like, are they talking about pitching? Like, I don't know. I don't even know. I know they're talking about pitching, but I don't know if they're talking about pitching. Like I pitched, I've done a million pitching drills, done a million strength training exercises. Uh, I pitched, and I don't know if you're referring to pitching. Like, I don't know what those words are. And I know for a fact, I don't need to know what those words are to help a kid get better. And if you're saying this out loud, is that how you're explaining it to an 11 year old? Or is that how you're explaining it to a 14 year old? Really? You just figure out that a lot of these people and these internet gurus don't work with kids because you just know that they don't, because if they explained it that way to a kid, the kid would just give them a blank stare and have no idea what's going on. And, uh, neither with the parents, like uh, most, a lot of parents that come to me and come to our facility, they do so because they want the knowledge that we possess to help their kid because they don't possess it themselves. And, and that's fine. If I have a daughter one day who does gymnastics, I don't know anything about that. I'm going to take her to someone who knows what they're doing and I'll listen and try to understand and probably do a lot of research so that I can understand and figure out if the coach is good or not. Um, and just to help nurture her along, but it's not our job to make it like code, you know, like I'm, and we try to sit down with parents when we can and explain what's going on. We hope they listen in and all that stuff, but you want to make sure that it's just, it just shouldn't feel like code. I think, and I've, you hear this from business leaders, from great business minds. And I know Richard Branson's, I think I got one of the really great quotes where he says that if you can't explain on the back of a envelope, it's rubbish. And he wouldn't invest in a company like that. And that's what you hear over and over from investors. If you ever watch Shark Tank, and I'm not a huge fan of Shark Tank, but I've actually been watching some stuff by that Kevin O'Leary guy because I know who he was and I looked him up. And uh, I actually really like a lot of the stuff that he says. And I've liked listening to some of his, his clips and his monologues and him relating his business experience. I think he's really bright. Um, but, uh, you know, like they all, they want to immediately understand the concept. Like, okay, what are you pitching? And if you can't explain your idea, your your thing, and this is something I've struggled with on my websites, on my courses. Like, what is it that you're selling? And, uh, it's the same thing. It's like, if you can't explain pitching to a 12 year old, then you probably don't know it that well yourself. I mean, you should be able to understand the complex movement. And then I take the complexity and make it simple for you because you don't need biomechanical language. 
And I try to explain everything that I can personally and not dumb it down, but just explain it in a way that makes sense. You know, like there's spin axis and spin rate and all these different air flows and Magnus effect. Like they don't really care about that stuff. We can talk about the physics of the baseball. Look, hey, it's going to spin 12. We want it to spin 12, six. We don't want it to spin a combination of 12, six and other spins. We just want it to spin really clean on a 12, six axis. You know, the world, the globe, the world spins on an axis, right? It only spins if you drill the hole through it and you spun it. That's what a spin axis is. And that's like, that's not a rocket science explanation. It's not a world changing like, oh, Dan, how did you ever explain it like that? It's just really basic. But that's how I would explain it to my little nephew who's six if he asked me what a spin axis was. So I just think sometimes internet coaches and potentially real life coaches, I'm not around a lot of real life coaches, but I observe a lot of internet coaches. They just seem to want to act as smart as they can so they can impress other coaches and I don't really understand that because to me, it just exposes that they're not really working with young players. They're only, they're only working with high level players, which there's still lots of very stupid high level players who probably would appreciate a more layman explanation. But it just, to me, doesn't seem like they understand it because I think when, if you're an outsider and you're explaining, you didn't play high level baseball or you're not, you haven't done a lot of coaching. I think explaining things really simply makes you feel like, I don't have all this experience and I'm making it sound really basic. So now I don't really know anything, but if you don't really know much and you explain it really, com really in a really complex way, then it makes you seem like you've got something special. Like you under, you have a deeper understanding and that's not really the way it is. Uh, there's definitely some stuff out there that I don't personally understand because I'm just like not well versed in it. And some of these people know stuff that I don't know and they could explain it to me. Um, so I'm not saying that everything that I hear, I completely understand and they should have just made it simpler. That's not always the case. There's definitely stuff out there that they're talking about that. I just don't know the terminology that I'm not versed in, you know, effectors and all these different, I don't know, neurochemicals and the way there's lots of like learning stuff that's out there. Um, and, but it's just the same time, like you could say movement patterns or you could just say like the way your arm moves, like your arms movement pattern, or just like, yeah, the, the, your arm action. Like we've been saying arm action for, for years. And uh, in a lot of ways, the internet's making stuff more complex than it was. So if your coach is too confusing for your kid, if you listen in, you're like, I don't think little Johnny's getting it. It's not a great sign. And it's probably an indicator that either not going to get through to your kid or uh, maybe they don't know it as well as they think, or they're just not working with a lot of kids because you figure it out when you explain something to someone, you get a blank stare. You're like, ah, I got to make that simpler and easier to understand because they clearly didn't get it. And when they don't get it, it's your job as a coach to make sure they, they get it. Um, and then on the other side of it, if they're just too vague, there's like, Oh yeah, do it like this. Or just, you guys supposed to do that. Or if it just seems like they gloss over stuff, cause maybe they just don't really know the ins and outs of it. That's kind of the other side of the coin. And that's not great either. So you want to find that middle ground where it seems like they do know what they're talking about. Um, and I'm certainly not, this is not an advertisement for me. I'm not perfect. Definitely not. Uh, but I think I strike a decent balance of being like heady enough where I'll explain a lot of stuff, but I'll try to make it simple and also not try to gloss over it too much either. Just be like, Oh, just do it this way. Or this is the way I did it. Uh, and that's the next thing. If a coach is talking too much about the way they did as a player, it's not a great, it's not a great thing because you wonder if they're just teaching what worked for them or what they're objectively teaching that will work for lots of people. And I take my own experience and I try to relate it to other people, but, the one thing you do when you work with lots of kids and lots of pitchers and uh, you realize that they all throw different, like they're not all the same. And they're certainly not all me. There's a handful of kids out of every hundred that like really remind me a lot of myself, whether it's the way they throw, whether it's their arm action, whether it's their, just the way they set up, they're just body type or the way the ball spins or whatever. There's like lots of similarities, but not in everyone. And I don't want to try to make everyone like me, but there's always going to be a bias, right? I'm always going to teach, a little bit more of the stuff that I know compared to someone else. So, you know, if you were a lefty, you'd be right probably to choose a lefty pitching instructor, perhaps if he was available and he was really good over me, who's a righty, like he's just going to know funky, weird, psycho lefty stuff a little better than I would. I would, you know, like I'm pretty good at teaching a lefty pickoff move, but because I've like studied it and look at video and all this other stuff, uh, but I'm not going to have the nuance of a lefty. Like I really just won't, I, I never will because I wasn't a lefty. I didn't pick off guys at first base as a left-handed hitter or as a left-handed pitcher. Like that's 
a definite gap in my knowledge, even though I can teach the mechanics of the move pretty well. And I think I've done a good job of that with our lefties. Um, we picked off a lot of kids last summer and that was really more their hard work, really putting in the time. It's really just a basic kind of movement, but they really, those kids really hit it hard. Uh, kudos to, uh, to Porter and Drew, but, um, you know, they, uh, they took a basic thing from me that I knew I could like teach the movement, but if they had a lefty, like really talking about, Oh yeah, your weight shit, your weight's going to do this sometimes. Or when you see this, you can pick your foot up a little bit, but you know, if you see him go, then you can immediately do this or do that. Like there's so much nuance to that. I'm sure that I just will never have. So, you know, but at the same time, we don't want to talk too much about personal experience because then it seems like they might be trying to make you into them, not in any like sinister way. Like, they just might not know too much better outside themselves. And they should have a pretty good understanding that everyone's unique and uh, that there's not maybe their way or the highway, I guess. And then the last couple red flags, um, you should see definite change over time. So the instructor you work with in year one, he should be kind of different year two and then kind of different year three. Not like different, but they should just, you should see some refinement. You should see them changing. You should see like some new drills get introduced every here and there. I don't retool my drills, but some of the drills I do today, like my book, I have a book that I published in 2013. Every, like periodically, I think, God, my book is getting more outdated. Like I need to update it. Uh, and it, I know that most of it's not that not out of date because the stuff I put in that book are principles more than anything. Um, they're pitch sequence principles, their practice principles, they're like the way pitching mechanics are. But at the same time, there's definitely some stuff in my book with, uh, with pitching mechanics that I've like found better ways to do it or better ways to explain it. Or there's a couple things that I think probably just like, I don't believe that anymore. Um, and there's some drills that I've definitely fallen out of favor, but there's only like a couple of them. I mean, uh, yeah, definitely buy my book, but no, it's, uh, you just evolve over time as a coach. And I felt that way six months after I released the book. I felt that way a year after I released the book. I'm like, I can't keep updating this thing every year, but every handful of years I probably will. And it's only probably swapping out 2% of the material, like a really small amount, because most of the stuff I put in there was only the most important stuff that was like tried and true and really, really long-term important because I'm not going to, again, I'm not like a big gimmicky guy, like, you know, use this, uh, I don't know, like, I'm going to leave the analogies. I've been brutal today, but you get my point. Everything you do should be out, out a little bit outdated in six months. You know, like you should be adding new things to the fold and just like, kind of like, Oh yeah, like that drill was good, but this drill is definitely like a little better for that same purpose. And this is like my go-to now. And that's completely okay. Like all these things kind of evolve and you learn new stuff. You work with new kids that teach you new things. You struggle to get through to a kid and you, and you break through and teach them some new thing that you just make up. And then it just like works really well and it's better than something else that you used to teach or better than a new way of explaining it. So there's always an evolution and, uh, and you should see that as a parent, you should see that over time, kids, you should see that over time, but it, it still shouldn't be different every year. There shouldn't be like, Oh, he used to be teaching this. Now he's teaching that. He used, it should be like mostly consistent, like 80, 90% the same stuff every year. And they just find new, better ways or new, more efficient ways. They just start explaining stuff differently they just start to get better at their job over time. But just because, you know, if you're a lawyer, uh, Oh God, I'm doing an analogy, but you know, it's not that like you get better over time, but you still do the same lawyering five years in that you did two years in. Right. But you're just more efficient with your time. You learn what doesn't matter as much. You just get better at doing tasks quicker, which is the same thing as being efficient, <laughs> but it's, uh, those are things you should see. So you should see progression over time. And then, uh, and then lastly, you should see technology trickling in. So number one is camera. Like they should be using video relatively regularly. There's a balance. And I know this as a, as a coach, cause I'll explain things verbally. If it's just going to ruin the flow of, and I'll, I use cues and I'll like say, Hey, you're here rather than here. But I only do that a certain percent of the time because I want them to see themselves because I know when they see themselves and they know what's right and what's not right or what's off and what could be a little bit better when they see it in themselves, it's going to click versus me telling them over and over, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. You hear that from your parents. You hear that from everybody. You're doing this, you're doing this, do it, do it, do it this other way. But when they see it and they understand what right and wrong looks like, what correct and, and not correct looks like, then they make, they really buy in better. So 
obviously I'm not just going to like take photos and take videos constantly throughout a lesson. It just ruins the flow of it. And, and pitching is just more than pitching mechanics and throwing. There's lots of other stuff, but there's more technology out there than ever. It's more powerful than ever. It's cheaper than ever. So there's not a really good excuse for a coach not using slow motion video now that every phone in America does it. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot more tracking devices like Modus, like Rapsodo, like uh, Blast Motion, Diamond Kinetics. There's radar guns. There's lots of more stuff. And we don't use all those things. Like we don't really use the hitting motion sensors that much. We're probably going to use them a little more this year than we had in the past. We've used the Modus sleeve in the past. It was kind of a fail for our team wide, but we still use it individually. I'll use it definitely for sure this winter. Um, there's some value in tracking more things that you can previously not track, but not everything also needs to be tracked. Like just because other coaches use it doesn't mean that it's a making your your kid better. And the vast majority of the time your kid is going to be, or players when I'm talking to you, you're going to be out there in a field playing catch in a baseball field. Like you don't need a rap. So you don't need a, like you don't need constant feedback all the time, but when you use it as checkups and you use it as like, Hey, can you see now? what you're doing. That's really important. I don't think you need to be in a lab, a pitching lab constantly. I think that's, that's not how the vast majority of pitchers were created. And just because, I mean, that's the is ought fallacy. I'm not going to fall into that, but just because like lots of pitchers before us came without all this high tech and lots of players after us will come without all this high tech. I mean, Latin America, whether it's Venezuela, Dominican, Puerto Rico, wherever amazing ball players are coming out with bats that don't have paint on them. I mean, they're swinging metal bats that they've hit so many times that the paint's all worn off when they're not swinging a wood bat. And uh, they're not doing high speed video. They're not doing any of this stuff and they're still getting really, really good. So just don't stress it. But at the same time, it's available to us here. And if a coach doesn't use any of it, it's not a great, it's not a great sign because if they're telling you, oh, I can see, I can see it all in my eyes, they're lying. I mean, video cameras catch way more. And again, they, they have the mirror effect. They show an athlete so he can see with his eyes what you see with your eyes. That's very, that's the most valuable thing. I can tell a kid what he's doing in space. I have a pretty good idea, but it doesn't, it's not more valuable than showing him. I'm telling him I'd rather show him. So that's another big thing. So those are some red flags. And I don't know if you'd say like a green flag or a white flag, but you know, the big things are just like coaches should clearly have passion for their job. They should clearly evolve over time. You should see them getting better at their job over time, spending time with continuing education. And you won't see that stuff, but you'll, you'll see reflected in the way they do things. And they should just, they should care about your kid and they should connect with them. So if you don't have that, uh, if they don't genuinely enjoy working with them, then just find someone else, even if they're really, really good, uh, you know, that you're going to spend so much time and coaches are so influential, even as instructors, they're so influential that if both, they don't both enjoy their time with each other, it's just not going to be a, a good long-term situation. It's much more than just mechanics and all this other stuff. You know, when you believe in a kid and they know that you believe in them and, and think they're cool and all this other stuff, they're more likely to go home and work hard. They're more likely to get, you know, good grades in school, all these other secondary and tertiary effects of just having a, a positive relationship with another person, who's not in their family. And that's a, and that's a big thing obviously as well. And, uh, you know, and Lucas and I know that in the end, like we really, like there's so many kids that have left our program that they just will come back and visit us. They'll send us a message and just like check in. And, uh, because they're just like good relationships that now that they're out of sports and they're out of college, like they're just, they will just be our friends. And that's really cool. And that's something that's, that's special. Cause at the end of the day, like we really, like I said before, like, I really don't care um, how many guys went off to the pros. Like you'll never hear me really brag about that at a bar anytime in the future. And that's not why I don't really care to be like, I won't rule out that in some distant future, maybe I have some role in pro baseball, uh, but I probably won't. I probably don't care if I don't ever do, like, I don't feel like I need to validate myself or that training guys who are already extremely good makes me in some way a better coach. Um, you definitely learn tons of stuff from training great athletes. You learn just tons of stuff. And by seeing being in that environment, you definitely learn tons of stuff from being around kids and you can use it in both directions. Stuff you teach kids and the way you boil it down is important to help reach more pro guys too. And just find out like what's really valuable and stuff you learn from pro guys uh, will obviously boil down and be valuable 
to kids because there's so many great athletes that figured it out on their, on their own and they'll explain the little nuances that they do with stuff like, oh, I did this. It'll blow your mind just spending a whole day or a week with a bunch of athletes who are willing to share stuff that they did to get to that point. Like they have so many little nuanced things that are always different from player to player and they're super interesting. And you can always, that, again, that's, again, one of the things that I was really disappointed to lose out on when I had to hang them up. So, um, I think that's where we're going to wrap up today, but thanks for being back. I appreciate the, the uh, patience with my schedule. I don't know. Uh, I, I value, I enjoy my podcast. I especially, I, I enjoy doing interviews. Um, I just been pulled in a lot of directions and sometimes sitting down for a, a 45 minute monologue is, uh, is tough. And yeah, I don't know if I'm making excuses for myself. I don't know if you care or not. Uh, I do care about putting out content regularly because I'm sure a lot of you, when you listen, you hope that you get the little ding, the little notification that there's a new episode every certain day. And, uh, it nags at me that I don't do that. I need to get on a consistent schedule. I know. And hopefully as I get a little more organized, I can do that and get a, a fresh web, uh, a fresh webisode, whatever you call it. I don't know why you call it a webisode, <laughs> a fresh podcast episode every week, every Tuesday or something. We've been pretty regular with uh, the Twinsies podcast, but um, anyway, uh, the last thing I'm going to say today is I really would like an email or a message of any, any kind. It could be Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, an email. I'd really like to know and just consider this a personal favorite to me. I really like to know why you listen to my show. And if you do listen to it, and if you have a reason, I'd really like to know why. If you're a dad and you have a kid who's 13, he plays baseball, or you're a mom and you just really like baseball, you're a, you're a grandpa and you have little nephews that run around. And I, I don't know what your reason is for listening to my podcast. Maybe you're a coach, maybe you're a str- I don't know. But I get very little feedback on the podcast. I get a lot of feedback from other social media, but I'd really like to know who you are and why you listen and what I could talk about. Not because I'm out of ideas, because I'm not, and I can, I think, tell stories and do a pretty decent job talking, but um, I just want to know why you tune in. Because there's a reason. It's not like a little superficial reason, like I just like baseball. It's like you're listening because you're hoping to get something to give your kid a leg up in sports. Like you hope that, that, that he lacks something and maybe you hear that you can relay a quote or you can relay... I don't know what it is, I really, but I really just don't, and I really would like to. So I've talked about this in recent other things that people have enough time to do whatever. So I promise if you email me, I'll email you back. I promise if you message me, I'll message you back. And if you even want to, you say, hey, Dan, I really like to talk to you on the phone for five minutes. I'll call you back. So consider it a favor to me. Shoot me a message. Tell me who you are, why you listen. I don't need praise or anything for it. I just would like to know like, Hey, I'm a parent. I'm a baseball coach. Uh, I like your show. You don't say you like it. You can say you hate it. Uh, but I listen because of this and, uh, I'm really interested in this type of content. And, uh, when you talk about this, I find it meaningful. And when you ramble on about this and make analogies that go nowhere, uh, I hate it, whatever it is, just let me know. All right. This is the dear baseball gods.